here you are and just this one transaction you did, you could produce almost $6,000 a month in cash flow. Is that enough for you to live off of? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. All right, everyone, welcome to today's interview. I'm super excited to have Michael Brockway join us. He is out in the Denver, Colorado area, and his story is pretty exciting. I don't want to be I don't want to be able to share it in the beginning here, but I do want Michael to share his stuff. But Michael, thank you for joining us today and jumping in this interview. Yeah, for sure. I'm happy to be here. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Well, can you tell us like, you know, we could live anywhere in the world, right? For everyone that's watching, you could pick anywhere in the world. Why Denver for you? Um, I would say my, the, the biggest selling point of Denver is honestly lifestyle. And for me, in my stage of my life, my journey, it's a perfect place. Um, I used to live in upstate New York. I was working a corporate job for a Goldman Sachs subsidiary, um, working long hours, going through grad schools, getting my, my licenses, my financial services licenses. And I essentially just wanted to, to live a different life. So I packed my stuff. I bought an enclosed trailer. I drove out to Colorado and that was about eight years ago. And I never looked back. Um, Denver is surprisingly warm. There's a lot, a lot of days of sunshine. Um, there's a lot of startup companies here. There's a big tech presence and therefore that draws a lot of, a lot of talent and a lot of young professionals as well. So, um, outside of just the city and, and all the benefits there, you have the mountains. I'm a big winter sports person. I like to snowboard. I like to backcountry snowmobile. Um, and that's, that's just, um, you really can't replace that. Honestly, that stuff being in my backyard, I think traffic is getting a little bit worse every single year with more people moving here, but I really can't complain. That's awesome. I love boarding. Where's your favorite place to, to hit the slopes? Um, I would probably say Beaver Creek. Um, it's just, just past Vail, a little bit farther West. Not a lot of people know about it. It's, it's not a, you know, big destination for, for tourists. Mm -hmm. And then second one would be Breckenridge, just because I have some friends that live downtown Breckenridge and it's always cool to see them and ride with them. Yeah, no, I love it. Breckenridge is my number one. We would take uh, trips every couple of years out there and just to go nice. board because it's just, it's beautiful. And then I love doing uh, Keystone at night. The sun sets there. Oh, yes. Gorgeous all through Denver or uh, Colorado too. Mm -hmm. But I, when I go board at night there, it's just like, oh, it's so awesome. Yeah, so. for sure. Cool. Well, let's give everyone a little bit of your background. You already started jumping into it, but tell us where your journey's kind of started and how did you get to where you are today and what do you do today? Yeah, good, good question. So I, I thought that I needed to, to go to school and get my master's degree. So I did my MBA with a concentration in finance and, and via that program, I, was, I got an internship, which got me a full-time job um, at that Goldman subsidiary. And it was great. It was a great learning experience. I did that for about three years and I don't want to say I was bored, but I just wanted something new. Right. So I, I jumped ship. I moved out to Denver um, with no game plan at all. And I took about a month to explore. Um, I hiked some, some 14 years, which is, which are these, if, for, for those that don't know, it's a, a, a mountain with a peak that's 14,000 feet high. Um, so super challenging, but you know, again, just a once in a lifetime experience that you won't get anywhere else outside of Colorado. Um, so fairly, fairly unique here. And then eventually I was like, okay, I need, I need to get a job. I need to produce some income. So I, based on my background, it was just easiest to get a job at another financial firm, which was Fidelity Investments. And there I worked in investment product, learned a lot about um, ETFs and sectors, um, always had a interest in real estate and always wanted to own a property. Um, so right when I got that job, I started looking for properties in the area and I closed on my first house, which was a, a house hack before I knew what house hacking was. And from there, I just continued to buy rental properties. I got a few Airbnbs, I have one commercial property. And this year I am looking at larger multifamily properties and also going to be moving into some syndication as well. Oh, so awesome. So are you still in the financial world or are you full-time in real estate at this point? Full-time full real estate. I quit that job in, did it for about three years. I quit it in um, right around 20, 2016. And that was when I closed my second property. And this is actually a pretty funny story. Um, a little, took a lot of risk here, but I just wanted to, to do something else, but I wanted to get another property under my belt. And I closed on my second property. 
my second rental out here the day I left that job. So there wasn't a lot of wiggle room as far as mm. uh, the mortgage was concerned, but everything worked out. I would never do it again. Um, it was very stressful. And at the time I had a pretty high risk tolerance, um, but I made it happen and then continued on my journey. Oh, that's so exciting. And I love that. I want to back up because you said when you got out to Denver, you, you took an entire like a month to just go out and explore. A lot of people, they would have the mindset like, I need the money. I need money. I got to make sure I can provide. I don't want to see my savings drain down. Like, what was the mindset for you taking that month off to really enjoy yourself and explore? Yeah, I would, I would say it was definitely monumental for me. Um, I, it was, I would say like towards the second and a half of that month, I was like, okay, I'm going to start passively applying for jobs. But for me, I, I was in a new city. I'd never moved outside of New York before. Mm -hmm. And it was just my, my first opportunity ever to explore and to see what else is out there. Right. Um, and Denver is very diverse because it has a big city. We also have the mountains and a lot of things to explore. And there was just so much that I wanted to see um, that I, that I just had to, had to, had to take the time to go for it. Nice. Um, so I think it was, it was well worth it. I did drain out my savings pretty significantly, but I had some money saved up. And for me, I just put those experiences um, above the the cash or the, the, the monetary side of things. You know, I love that you said that because I always tell people, you know, we're our family and like, as we're like mastering life by design, right? It's mm -hmm. like, we collect experiences, not things. We do yeah. collect things, right? As we go, but experiences and memories are so much more valuable. And I think today's generation is really starting to wake up. They watch their parents and their grandparents work their butt off and they're like, I don't want that, you know, and nor do I, nor could we even have that. Like how my grandfather had a pension. He worked at Campbell's soup for 40 years. Wow. Like that's not happening now, right? But our generation, we see, we want free, uh, the freedom. We want the lifestyle. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of people are starting to value. So, yeah. And I think that's amazing for, for, for those with that mindset. And I'm sure he had a very successful career at Campbell's soup. For me, I could never imagine being in a company like that long term, right? And the the way of the new rich, they're starting to call it like is, is significantly different. It's about experiences, about traveling, it's about really doing those things that, that fulfill um, you and just drive you to to be happy. Yeah. And that's that's what this channel is all about is consciously creating the life you want, living life on your terms. And it sounds like you you have. And then once you got to Denver and you started getting settled. You had a bigger vision and you jumped into real estate. Like mm -hmm. what's exciting about real estate? Why, why that financial vehicle to create the life that you want? Um, I think there's just a lot of benefits of real estate, right? I mean, I would say that a, a, a big point for me personally, because of my background being in financial services for six years, um, I, I did a little exercise for myself and looked at my like personal investment allocation or asset allocation. And I have only like 5% of my net worth invested in stocks and bonds and investments and everything else is in real estate or syndications or crypto, just alternative asset classes really. Um, but going back to the, the question, I mean, real estate is there's, for me, it's, it's cash flow. Honestly, and it would be number one because cash, if it, these assets, these, these investments are kicking off cash flow, that cash flow can fuel my lifestyle and the life I want to live. Right. So I'm really investing for cash flow. <laughs> Um, so any rental property I've ever looked at, it had to cash flow, um, right. At least a thousand bucks. So I did buy one that, that cash flowed about 800 bucks a month. And that's very difficult to do in an expensive market. So I have gotten creative on, on, on how I'm doing that. And it was, was easier prior to the last few years. Um, but a sec, another strategy I'm looking, I'm, I've been implementing is converting some of those units to Airbnbs, which are producing more cash flow, a little more legwork there. Um, it's a little more active, but if you get the right systems in place, um, you can create less work for yourself, but also create more active or you know, semi-active income via short-term rentals. And then on top of that, it's just a wealth building play, right? I mean, I have some properties that, I mean, one example is I bought a property, um, two years ago and it was super expensive in my mind. It was $900,000 for a triplex that I converted to a quad to boost that cash flow. And that property has um, appreciated four hundred thousand dollars over the past two years, which is two hundred k per year, which is which is insane in my mind. And I never thought that was going to happen with that property. I was very um, 
a little anxious about buying it in the first place, but I was able to make it work by adding that fourth unit. And by taking that risk, adding that fourth unit, getting creative, I created a ton of cash flow for myself as well as some massive appreciation. Um, and with that appreciation, like my game plan is to do a, um, a HELOC and eventually pull that equity out to then redeploy elsewhere into more cash flowing assets. Oh, so much gold right there. And the one thing I want to ask, because a lot of people who might be watching, they might find themselves like, okay, I keep hearing passive income. I know, mm -hmm. I think I should step into it. Here you are, you were looking at a deal and I love your criteria. And we'll talk about that here in a moment, but you had this fear of this triplex, you turn into a, a quad. Mm -hmm. What was it that got you over the edge? Like, was there a specific thought or something that really helped you kind of say, you know what, let's move forward. Let's, let's do this instead of allowing the fear to consume you and be like, ah, I'm good. Yeah. That's a really good question. I was, I was looking at a property that was about, I was targeting something around 500,000, maybe four to 500,000 that maybe had, um, two units in the main, in the house and then zoning to build an ADU. So I was going for three units, but I'd have to do some construction to get to build that ADU and that'd be more costs. Um, and less favorable financing, I would say, but it was just a mindset shift, honestly, and a, just maybe being a little bit, being able to stomach that risk. And I think those two things go, go hand in hand. I mean, if you have the right mindset, it's not as risky. As long as you run your numbers and you have your plan B and your plan C, um, which comes with having the right mindset, it became, I was able to stomach that, that, um, that investment, that, that play, but I would say before I stepped foot in the property and before a friend of mine who's a broker found the deal actually off market, um, I was not in the right mindset to, and I did not have the appetite to purchase it. But once I ran the numbers, thought about it, thought about how to get creative with the deal and um, started digging into it, I was, I was not, um, did not have the appetite again, but <clears throat> that I, I went for it and took that risk. Nice. So really the numbers and seeing what was possible and how it met your criteria, maybe even beyond was what really helped you. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And that was definitely a personal draw to the property as well. Um, I was living in a, in one of my units in a duplex that I owned and I wanted to get out of that neighborhood into a nicer neighborhood. And that was a lifestyle thing, right? I mean, the neighborhood I was in was very close to, um, downtown Denver, the Rhino area, River North Art, Art District, it's called um, the, the Highlands, but I was not in a nice neighborhood. I'll say that. Um, it's definitely not a neighborhood that you would want like your daughters living in. <clears throat> so for me, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a young single guy. Um, I just want to be a nicer area. So I actually moved into one of the units in this, in this triplex. And I, live in, I moved into the nicest unit. It's, it was 2,500 square feet. It has a rooftop deck over a two car garage and I actually split that unit to two, two units that are about 1200 square feet. Um, and it's, there was a lifestyle component to it as well. Nice. I love that, that you were able to split. Now, a lot of people might say, you know what, that's scary. Like how do you turn a 2,500 square foot place into a 1200 square foot place? And so they might be a little nervous to do that, but if you go and you don't have to share exact numbers, but like what's rough numbers when someone does something like that? Like, why mm -hmm. is that beneficial for them to be able to grow their wealth, grow their cash flow so that they can have the freedom that they're looking for? Yeah, yeah, super good question. Um, <clears throat> so prior to dividing up the units, there were some tenants in place when I bought the property. I believe they were paying about 3,000 bucks total for the entire space, the single unit that was, that was 2,500 square feet. Um, and by, so I could have totally moved in, utilized the full space and that unit in itself wouldn't have cash flowed anything for me. Right. The other two units, um, that were occupied would continue to cre create, create revenue. Um, but my mindset was, Hey, like, I want to make this work. I want to take this risk. So, and I don't really need 2,500 square feet. Right. right. So I put about, I'd say, I went, I went pretty hard on this uh, property as far as remodel goes, <clears throat> but I would say I probably put, you know, $40,000 into a new kitchen downstairs, a separate HVAC system in the upstairs unit and downstairs unit, which, which, which brought it from just heat with, via a boiler to central air upstairs, central air downstairs. 
Um, mm-hmm. just so both units were very comfortable and it was well worth the investment. Um, so if I were to say, I wasn't living upstairs and I rented the two units out separately, I could, I could definitely get, um, $2,000 each. So then I'm boosting my cash flow from 3000 to 4,000 for two units. Right. So I'm creating a thousand bucks extra per month. Mm-hmm. And in my mind, that's well worth it. And I, how, how I'm renting out the downstairs, I actually have, um, it's a three bedroom, one bath, and I'm, I'm renting out per room to young professionals to, to boost the cash flow even more. And each person downstairs is paying 900 per room plus, um, utilities as well. We split utilities. So arguably I'm getting close to $3,000, um, for that one unit. And if I were to put my upstairs unit on Airbnb <clears throat> or get creative with it as well, I could probably get three thousand dollars in my, in my my upstairs unit, and then instead of four thousand, I would be collecting six thousand, right? So I'm doubling the cash flow from three thousand to six thousand in that scenario. Wow, hey, guys, if you're watching this and your head's spinning because of all these numbers, go back watch this again. But literally. <laughs> you know, his thought process is about how to maximize his cash flow. And my guess is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, you did your homework before you started to execute on all this, right? Before you started to do the $40,000 remodel, you ran the numbers, right? You weren't just like, hey, yeah, let's go do this and hope it works out, right? You ran the numbers, correct? Yeah, definitely. And because I have other properties in the Denver metro area, I knew what, um, I knew what, what things were rented out for roughly. Um, I, I used some data as well, um, just some basic tools. I think it, it was like Rentometer was one of the tools I used at the time just to see what it would um, demand on a long-term lease versus um, room by room versus short-term mm-hmm. rental. And this is in the city of uh, Wheat Ridge and they're, they're semi-favorable when it comes to short-term rentals. As long as you go through the correct process, you can get a license for two, up to two short-term rentals um, in the city of Wheat Ridge per individual. So I definitely did my homework. I knew what I would, what the units would demand from a short-term, um, long-term, medium-term or room by room in those scenarios. That's awesome. Some people sit back and they may say, well, I don't know how to do that. And I think we can both sit here and say, it's like, we, you didn't know how to do this when you were born either, right? It's something we had right. to learn. It's something that we have to research. And, and right now with, Facebook and masterminds and all those great things out there, you have answers everywhere. There's no shortage of information, right? They might be sifting through certain stuff, but you really, when you do your homework, there's a certain risk and certain fear that comes up, but by knowing your numbers, it totally mitigates the risk Mm -hmm. drastically. And I love where your head's at because a lot of people, uh, you know, I have a friend of mine who has three homes four homes, <clears throat> not in a, it's uh, I don't want to give it, give this person away, especially if they're watching, but like they paid off their homes, these rental properties of theirs. They use their cash to pay these houses off, which I personally would never do that because I would take that cash and go get more assets. Yeah. The name of the game, the way people get wealthy is through assets, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love what Grant Cardone says. He says, the more debt that you have, the more wealthy you can become. Yeah. And all about I leverage. That. that? It's all about leverage. <laughs> Absolutely. So, okay. So you could have been able to rent that place out, maybe make three thousand dollars as it was, but you went in, you invested forty grand, and if you were to Airbnb it, rent each room out, you could possibly get six grand versus that three. Mm-hmm. If you times that out over twelve, right, like that profit of three thousand dollars from six to three. Over 12 months, every year you're profiting $36,000. You're able to go out there, and I know prices are astronomical now, but you're able to literally fold time and save yourself years versus if you were to just have it as a long-term rental. Right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and, and based on my rehab budget, which was $40,000 for that downstairs unit, if I was able to hypothetically make back that $36,000 in one year, that's a no-brainer in my mind. I'll finance that cost all day. I've done different strategies, short-term and long-term strategies for financing, um, everything from HELOCs to um, 0% APR credit cards that are good for 18 months. So if you, if you, if you get scrappy and you are creative, you can make things happen for yourself. And I wanted to also reinforce a point you made earlier about 
it is when you are starting up, it is hard to wrap your head around these things. But, but I would say it's not only are the resources out there, but in my opinion, it's information overload these days. I mean, it's like, okay, who do I listen to? What calculators do I use? What, what spreadsheets, um, what STR Facebook group do I want to be a part of? Because there's so many options out there. I mean, if people want to take initiative to do this and truly impact their lives, that the stuff is out there. You just need to create the time and make it a priority to do so. All right. So great point. So we got a working professional. They're working their nine to five. They're making great money, but they realize, you know what? I don't want to do this for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Not like the company would let you be there for 30 years, but if you had to get started all over, where would you recommend someone starts? Like what are some resources that they could start plugging into to learn and get educated? What are your favorites? Um, as far as resources go, I'd say masterminds are great. Um, you and I are both part of GoBundance. Yeah, and share, share with everyone what GoBundance is and, and qualifications and all that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I, I have heard about, I had heard about GoBundance in the past through a friend of mine, um, Craig Curlop. He's a bigger pockets guy, and he was talking about. It. I'm like, oh wow, like you're in GoBundance. I thought that was something for like the uber wealthy or like billionaires, right? Yeah. And he, him and I started talking about it. And he's like, no, man, as long as you have a net worth of a million dollars, which, you know, can include real estate, um, business, a business, cash investments, um, as long as you're at that a certain level, as far as your, your net worth goes, you can join GoBundance. And the, the, the term they use is a tribe of millionaires. And it just comes back to the, the principle that, that no one will argue with, in the, which is the fact that you are your tribe. You are who you surround yourself with, right? And that's why mentorship... Um, and masterminds and just surrounding yourself with high caliber people is so important. That's awesome. I, and if you, you guys, if you listen to Audible, I highly suggest listening to the book, Tribe of Millionaires, right? That's mm -hmm. such a great book that the creators um, wrote. And one thing I, one thing I always, I remembered was like, as I started my financial journey, when I got out of the Marine Corps at 23, I got involved in Amway and I thought that was the way to become wealthy, right? <clears throat> Some do. Mm -hmm. um, but after about five years, I started going down a different path, but I always remembered, I was like, I want to be, you know, the goal is to become a millionaire, right? Yeah. And, and I say this the most humbling way, it's like join Go Abundance. I didn't even realize that we crossed the seven figure path, right? And right. so as I started to look back, I'm like, becoming a millionaire isn't really that hard, right? Mm -hmm. It just takes a difference. You have to think differently than trading time for money, right? And if you guys have never heard of the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that would be a great spot to start listening and about passive income and um, the different quadrants out there. I, I love that book. And actually, my uh, one of the masterminds I'm in, the guy, his name is Tom Burns. He actually bought the first copy ever of Rich Dad Poor Dad at a get at wow. a uh, car wash. Wow! <laughs> and he was in Amway, and so he started giving it to his downlines, and then mm -hmm. he tried. He he was like, I got to get this in the system of Amway, and so he called the publishers, like, who's this Robert Kiyosaki guy? I want to be able to do this, and then so he started. It started blowing up through Amway, and then Oprah caught wind of it, and. Robert became Robert, but, um, and then Robert told Tom Burns to write a book called Rich Dad, or excuse me, um, Why Doctors Don't Get Rich. And I have the book right here. And, um, and Robert had him give that title and he finally wrote the book. So they're good friends, but awesome. Um, and he's also part of GoBundance too. Right, right. Good stuff, man. Love it. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So getting back to, we were talking about the long-term, you know, long-term rentals as a, you know, way to create wealth and how that really takes years. Even if you bought one a year, you would dress, it would take, you know, almost a decade to even get to close to financial freedom, depending on your criteria yeah. for how much cash flow you want to have. But here you are, and just as one transaction you did, you could produce almost $6,000 a month in cash flow. Is that enough for you to live off of? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. I, I think this this goes hand in hand with the, the the desire for people out there to become a millionaire, right? Um, it's it sounds like it's like the end goal, and at least that was my mindset. But once I realized that I was there and I had that net worth, I was like, okay, what's next? And mm -hmm. to answer your question, you know, I could totally live off of six thousand dollars a month if I wanted to, right? It really depends what your priorities are, where you want to live, 
Um, if you have a property or an asset or a house that um, you are house hacking or living in one unit like this quad um, and the other, the other units pay your expenses, your, your expenses are very low. Um, everything else beyond that is fairly discretionary. Um, but my, my end goal was about $10,000 a month passive. Mm -hmm. And depending on what you quantify as totally passive, I'm, I'm right there right now, but now I have new goals and now I'm setting, setting new, new higher standards for myself. Yeah. Um, if I want to go out and buy a property in Hawaii where I have a lot of family, um, and, and live there once I'm semi-retired and just focusing on giving back and coaching, then I can do that. But, but properties in Hawaii are very expensive, right? So now I have new goals and just because I want to live a, a, a pretty, pretty solid life. Um, once I re retire at 40 is my game plan. Um, I need to create more passive income to fund those, those, those hopes and dreams of mine. Um, and I also want a quick point too, is I, I think of this as a, you know, it's, it's a faucet. You can turn on the water as high as you want, or, or just let it be trickling. Right. And depending on your situation, you can only go so far, right? If you're, if you're married with a couple of kids, I mean, you're not going to go live in a house hack and, and live in one bedroom, right? You need to utilize a duplex, a triplex or a quadplex. You can have your own unit for your family, or you maybe don't even want to move into your rental properties, right? Maybe you just keep your primary home and you let your rental properties fuel or pay for your, your expensive. So it really depends on your situation, but I think anyone can at least take steps and go in the right direction and figure out what's right for them along the way. Can you explain to the audience what house hacking is? Some people might've picked up on it from what you're saying, but I just want to clarify it for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Really good question. Um, so if you're interested in house hacking, I definitely check out the book on house hacking by bigger pockets. My friend, Craig, who I mentioned, he wrote that book while he was there, but house hacking is essentially buying a property and living in one portion of it. So you could buy a single family house and live in one bedroom and rent the other rooms out to young professionals is what my, my strategy was. Um, and I just wanted to have good tenants and tenants that I, that I would get along with because I was sharing space with them, or you can take that, that, that approach to the next level, which is you buy a four unit property and you live in one unit versus one bedroom and you rent the rest out. Mm -hmm. And the, the hypothetical game plan there is by renting out the other portions of that property, whether it be bedrooms or units um, or putting, putting like the basement, maybe on Airbnb or a mother-in-law unit on Airbnb by, by doing so you cover your living expenses and you essentially live for free, or you can even profit um, while living for free, depending on the numbers on that property. Oh, that's so awesome. I remember when I lived in San Diego, I rented out a house. I didn't own it. I wish I did. Um, but I literally lived in the master bedroom, but I had like five other people living with me and I was paying like 300 bucks a month in San Diego for the master. Nice. But, uh, I wish I owned it. I wish I would have known what house hacking was, right? right? <laughs> how cool is it that, and the benefits of house hacking isn't just maybe make a profit and pay off you, your, 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 uh, you don't have to have living expenses, right? But it's also you're owning an asset that is going down in or not going down in value, but it's hopefully it's going up in value, right? right. But it's also you're paying the mortgage off. Mm -hmm. Someone else is paying the mortgage off. You're living for free. You're paying off that asset or they're paying off the asset and it should be hopefully appreciating. And so it's just an all around win. If you're a people person like me, mm -hmm. my wife always says I have, I, you know, married with two kids. And my wife always said, if it was up to me, we'd still be living in that house with a bunch of other people right now. So nice. <laughs> um, I raised my standards a little bit there, but yeah. it's so it's such a great way to kind of start off. If that's something, if you're single or if you are dating and you guys want to be money conscious and start the, the ball rolling, you know, doing what you've done is, is a great, great way uh, to do it. Um, share with people a little bit more about this vision that you have. How, how young are you right now? 35, 35 years young. <laughs> 35 years young. By 40, you have this goal of giving back out in Hawaii. So share a little bit more about that. Why is that important to you? Yeah, that's really, again, another good question. Um, I think I realized very early on when I started my career in financial services that I really enjoyed helping people. And that's, that's what drives me. That, that's what excites me. And if I can help someone improve their life, like what's, what's better than that, right? That, that's just super rewarding for myself. 
intrinsically and, and very rewarding for them as far as the benefits they get out of that. Um, and I'm even, I'm even doing this now, right now I'm helping those that want to get in, get into real estate from an active standpoint or even a passive standpoint. Mm. Um, so I'm doing a little bit of coaching mostly for friends in my small circle, but it's extremely rewarding to me. I, I like helping people. If I can help them buy their first property, be a little more efficient in buying that property, buying the right property that fits their, their goals and their needs, that's going to produce the, the most benefit to them. That, that makes me that makes me happy. So long-term, I'd like to just do that um, and not be working on active real estate deals like that um, triplex I mentioned that took a lot of work or some of the, the past properties that I, that I flipped um, or had to do a lot of rehab on to, to turn them into rentals or Airbnbs. Um, but eventually I'd just like to maybe work 20 hours a week, um, staying in touch with, with my, my close friends and my network that I've grown and also helping others who want to create financial freedom, which fuels, you know, a, a lifestyle that you can design and you can decide, you know, where you want to be, what you want to do and when you want to do it. That's amazing. So here you are, you hit your target or you're damn close to hitting a 10 K a month and passive income, which most people can't even think about. Most people don't even make 10 grand a month actively trading 40 to 70, 80 hours a week. Right. And here yeah. you are doing it passively. And so you hit this target, but now you have this bigger target. And every time I've talked to people in GoBundance or anyone that's extremely successful, I get the opposite understanding them, the social conditioning response of society about rich people, about people who are successful, which means they're so greedy, right? I always heard that growing up, wealthy people are greedy. They're, they're about themselves. It's all for them. But the more people I get to connect with, like people like you, their vision is more, their bigger and greater vision is about turning around and helping a hand, you know, to those that are on that path or want to be on that path. And they, they want to give back more, right? So it's actually the opposite of what I've heard growing up. I've seen very few people who are that stereotypical, you know, social conditioning of a rich person, right? It's like, usually they're, they're humble, they're, they're passionate about what they do, they want to create something bigger, and they want to give back. And that's a lot of the big things. And um, yeah. I, I can sit here and say, I had a, I had a, a mentor at one of my churches, and but when I was in San Diego, and he said something probably about 10 years ago that changed the way I looked at things. He said, I don't set goals. He says, I set giving goals. And I was like, yeah. He's like, because if I want to give a million dollars away, I got to go out and make five, 10 million. And I was like, oh, that's so good. Right. So I, I found that to be true. And I love what you, your vision um, of what you want to do and how you want to give back and how you want to help people. I just, that's so awesome. It shows your heart, which is so cool. Yeah. I, th I think it's a great, great takeaway. I mean, I've, I've definitely can think of some folks or contacts of mine that were, that were solid mentors to me. And I think about them like not just on a daily basis, but all the time. I mean, I'm like, okay, like if I, if I didn't get this advice from, you know, some, some, when I was younger from, from so-and-so, you know, where would I be today? If I didn't get this, you know, person helping me reach that next level or, or at least being a support network for myself, like I would not be where I'm at today. And <clears throat> I can, I can definitely see that perception of, of wealthy people being, being selfish, but it's, you have to help yourself before you can help others. And if you're not in a position to, to give back, there's no way you're going to be able to help others get to where you're at and, and where you hit, the, hit those goals you've achieved yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. It's like, we always hear, put your oxygen mask on first when you're on the plane, right? Before you help others. And so many people, I've seen so many great, amazing people. I even have family members like this they they're so generous and they give and they give and they give but they give at the expense and the sacrifice of themselves and so i don't consider that you know self love when you sacrifice yourself right i really think that's incongruent um with the mission that you're actually taking action on because you got to fill your cup first it's hard yeah. to fill someone else's if your cups not filled first so um i love that so here you are, you got these great goals, you're hitting them, you've created this great lifestyle. So everyone that's watching is probably like, yeah, that's great. But what are some of the struggles that you go through? Was it just like this smooth, you know, easy, you just you get a property, get another one, and you're doing great? 
what were some of the big struggles for you that you experienced on the journey so that other people, if they hit them, they know that's just a stepping stone on the path to success? Yeah, really, really good question. Again, I'm, I would say the first one that I can think back on, well, one, when I was, when I was in my working my W2 job and, and, you know, essentially a corporate slave, I just wasn't happy. Uh, I wasn't, it wasn't fulfilling. Um, it was a grind and that impacts your performance, right? If you're not, if you're not happy and you're not fulfilled, you're not going to going to perform well, or at least perform to your fullest ability. Mm -hmm. And that's why I needed to get out of that corporate job. And then once I got myself out of the, the corporate environment, the next, I guess, struggle I had was, was a big identity crisis. I mean, I was used to going to, um, going to work sometimes in the suit and tie, you know, having that very respectful title, those certifications, um, just that sexy, that sexy job. Right. And then I was transitioning to be an entrepreneur and that was a struggle for me. And I, I know, I know a lot of individuals that make this transition from a corporate job or W2 into being an entrepreneur or pursuing a new venture, they see the same struggles. They're like, okay, like how do I create structure in my day? How do I create purpose? Um, how do I make this transition? And that was a big, that impacted me mentally, um, fairly heavily. And it took me a while to get past that. I was maybe for two years introducing myself as like, Hey, I'm Mike, I used to work in finance, but this is what I do now. And I didn't think it was super sexy. Um, I had another small business that wasn't, that wasn't real estate related that also helped me create some cash flow when I first started off. Um, but it was definitely a struggle and the struggle is real. And eventually I, what, what did it for me was I really took ownership of my, my new career or my, my new purpose, which was being an entrepreneur, investing in real estate. And I realized that the lifestyle I wanted to create for myself was, was a lot cooler than having that W2 job, but it took me a little while to get there. Um, and I think that would, that definitely like stuttered my, my growth during that period. So I, my advice for others out there that are going through this transition or are thinking about it, say, Hey, like just own that new venture to own that new career. If you're doing it for a reason, go back to your why and remind yourself daily why you're doing it and mm -hmm. why it's cooler than what you're doing before and, and why it really matters to you. That's awesome. You said you, you hit the nail right on the head because I've coached a lot of people who transition from one career path to another or into graduate into entrepreneurship, which mm -hmm. isn't easy, right? Um, but it's, it can be a struggle for them because they put their, they built their entire life around this profession. And <clears throat> I always like to ask people like, who are you? And they tell me their job title versus who they are. Right. And the, the characteristics and their values of who they are, it's completely different. And yeah. so when you get your value, not from the external, right, like a job title and get it from the internal, it's so it makes life so much more fun and you're way more confident in who you are. And so I I'm sure there's people who do have a job that are listening. I got to ask the day after or maybe it was that monday after you left your job for good what was that experience like when you woke up and you didn't have to go to your job <laughs> it was a little scary to be honest i mean there's a lot of fear that's that that comes with making this transition mm. um but i really essentially my backup plan was to get another job right you can always get another job like what's the worst case scenario if you quit your job you take the time to pursue your new venture or your go to go down that road with your, for your new journey. You can always go back. You can always reapply for a new job with a new company. Uh, maybe try, try to find some part-time work, right? There's always that plan B, but from, and I, and I definitely thought about it, but I was honestly just too busy to think about it too much. Right. So I, I put myself in a situation where um, I had to, I guess, getting specific, I was, I just had moved into the duplex I'd purchased and it, it needed a little work. And I, I had to, you know, at the, at the time I was trying to keep my cash, I was trying to save money. I put low money down into that property and I, I definitely put some sweat equity into it as well. And I, I, it was my new job to get that property to a place where I could rent out that second unit and have that, that new tenant pay for a majority of the, the fixed expenses on that property. Um, and then beyond that, I, I just had no other choice. And I, I did not want to go back to those days where I felt um, 
empty and I had to complete heavy tasks. I actually have a picture of myself, a selfie that I took when I was sitting at my desk one day, just tired and miserable. And I just looked back at that photo occasionally. And I reminded myself like, Hey, this is not the person I want to be. Mm-hmm. And I never want to feel that way again. Yeah. Sometimes pain's a great motivator, isn't it? Like to keep you, you know, to get you moving and keep you on your path. That's awesome. I remember when I left my corporate job and I woke up the next day, I was excited, but I felt lost because it was just like, that's what I did, right? For so long. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, what do I do now? Right? Like, and so I was in network marketing at the time and going to school. So um, that kind of kept me a little bit busy, but I totally understand what you're saying because you think about in the back of your mind, like, what if, and that thought's going to be there, right? Like, in the beginning, when you step into entrepreneurship, like it's not a smooth ride to the top. It, it's, if anything, it's, it has its ups and downs, right? Mm-hmm. And so you're, the biggest thing you, when you step into entrepreneurship is to really be able to master your thoughts because otherwise it can consume you and allow you to fall into this trap of fear. And once fear gets kind of multiplying, all of a sudden it consumes you. You're, you're just thinking, all right, maybe I need to apply, right? Or maybe this isn't my path. And you start questioning and doubting yourself. And, you know, stop having that cue, that trigger, like you have that picture of you at your, at your job. It's like, no, 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 no. That can help break that pattern, a thought pattern of fear. So yeah. I absolutely, I love that. Awesome, man. Um, <clears throat> okay, so... Um, I, I'll ask this question first. What has been the most impactful book for you? Um, there's a couple that come to mind. And one of these is, goes alongside like one of the struggles I potentially, um, or I, I faced a lot throughout my journey is the book's called Who Not How. And you can only go f- so far solo until you can't scale or can't be productive enough to continue to scale and grow. Um, so it's really, it's really just the, 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 the message there is who, what tasks are you the best at? What do you want to keep doing? And then you have to outsource the rest mm. and you really can't grow and scale without other people or systems in place. And that was a big game changer for me. Um, so having, you know, I don't have any, for my real estate business, I don't have any W2 employees, but I have a lot of good partners, right? You think about what goes into running a successful, um, I guess, real estate investment company, you need contractors, you need cleaners, you need property management. Um, I've explored using VAs for certain things. Um, and you also need partners that are other real estate investors, right? That bring a different skill set to the table. Maybe they're underwriting properties for you, or they're helping you fund deals. Um, I think Brandon Turner says this really well you know, real estate investing is a triangle. And I can't even think of like the three parts of the triangle right now on the spot, but you only need to be good at, you know, a couple of those things. And you can always partner to reach that next level Mm. um, with, with other individuals, you know, having the excuse that like, Hey, I I can't fund this deal or, Hey, I can't find deals or, Hey, I don't have time. I think those are the three it's, it's, it's time deals and then funding. Um, you don't need to have all those things to be successful. You know, you may be in a situation where you have a, you have, you can bring the hustle, you have a bunch of time, but you don't have money, right? So go find a capital partner, find someone out there that is willing to invest in you and in a deal that doesn't necessarily have the time to make things happen. They need you, you need them. Um, it's a, it's a who question, not how will you do this solo question. That's such a good answer. Such a good answer. And that's the biggest problem for a lot of people that I coach is they actually find it difficult to leverage other people. They live in the in the real estate language to do it yourself world, right? But they think they have to do it. No one can do it better than them. And mm-hmm. what that does, that thought literally robs them of time and money, right? And yeah. lifestyle and fulfillment, right? Just like you, if you would have just rented that place out for three grand a month, you would have to go pay rent somewhere else and you would have had maybe a thousand dollars a month in cash flow versus the six grand that you can pull for it now. Mm -hmm. So that's such a such a key point. Who's one person that you really look up to and why? 
Man, really good question. Um, I don't know if I can really pick one person. Um, really good question. Um, I don't want to be super cliche and say someone that everyone everyone knows really well. Um, but I would I would say just to bring it bring it back home, I'm gonna say my my grandfather. Um, mm -hmm. He passed away a few years ago, and he was just a super hard worker. He was very positive um, and just brought really good energy to any situation. And something that he, he would always say to me is like, um, you know, no one's going to, no one's going to do it for Michael or help Michael. So you have to, you know, be a leader and do it yourself mm -hmm. and take that initiative, not necessarily do everything yourself, but you are responsible for your life, your you know, your goals and what you want to do in life. And that's, that's always stuck with me. Um, just having that accountability and that taking ownership, maybe extreme accountability on certain things. And yes, you will bring in partners and, you know, utilize banks and leverage and, and, and create use tools to get where you need to go. But at the end of the day, like you are responsible for, for your future and you need to take responsibility for that. Another book I want to throw out there is, um, you, you can't hurt me by David Goggins. Oh, great and that's book. just a, a really good example of like, Hey, like your life's going to be hard. Um, but it's your responsibility to, to get where you want to go and to get past those, those struggles. And again, just create that, that, that life you want to live. That's amazing. And great wisdom from your grandfather, the things that he taught you there. Um, and the biggest thing is responsibility, like personal responsibility, right? With so many people nowadays, this younger generation is getting handouts left and right. They don't know what it means to always, you know, take personal responsibility to live at cause, right? So, um, and that's probably why you are where you are. You're not looking for someone to hand you something, to give you something. You're going after it. You're taking responsibility for what goes well and what goes wrong. And you're mm -hmm. continuing to put one foot in front of the other. And that's why you have the life that you've had, you have. So, all right, before we wrap up, you got this great lifestyle. You have freedom. You know, you don't have to work a job. You're, I would assume you're unemployable at this point, correct? Yeah, I would say so. I'm definitely not. <clears throat> willing to work another job again. <laughs> okay, awesome. So what's one adventure you're looking forward to this year since you don't have to be at a job? Yeah. Um, I, I went on a small adventure to Guatemala recently, and that was a trip that some friends, a friend of mine organized and it was basically all real estate investors. Mm. And that was a very passive trip that I jumped on last minute but it just got me thinking, you know, I, this was amazing. I love surrounding myself with other real estate investors, other people with the same mindset have similar goals. So let's do this again. Um, so we, we kind of put our heads together and the next trip that I'm looking forward to would be a trip to the big Island. And my sister actually, who's out there, she invested in this property in the big Island. They did this crazy, um, burr. Um, they bought, they bought a house, they rehabbed it. Um, they refinanced it and pulled a bunch of cash out the largest like cash out refi I've ever heard of or known of someone close to me doing, but long story short, that property, um, they have an Airbnb and I, I talked to one of the owners and they're allowing us to stay there for a week with a group of friends. Um, they're also obviously in the real estate world. So we're going to take the opportunity. I'm going to bring some friends of mine that are doing big things in real estate, um, to go out there for a week and have fun, but also organically mastermind at the same time, surrounding yourself again with good people, um, doing fun <clears throat> things, going on epic adventures. I love hiking and being on the water as well when I'm in Hawaii. So I'm looking forward to doing some pretty um, epic waterfall hikes. Um, the big island, there's a ton of area to explore versus Oahu. I feel like I've hit all the major hikes there already. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to getting out there and just doing some exploring and just living in a really cool, um, the property appraised for about 10 million after wow. the fact. So it's a very high end property with an infinity pool and a hot tub and a ton of space. Um, so I'm just looking forward to being there in a great place with good people. That's amazing. 
Well, definitely have to post some pictures there and share those with uh, with the community, which is awesome. Um, very cool. I love the Big Island. Uh, I'm not like I, I think I shared this with you. I'm not a big fan of lava rock, but I love the Big Island because my favorite place is in Kona, and it's called Lava Lava. Okay. And it's uh, this cute little like barish restaurant right on the beach, and I know there's a ton of them. Mm -hmm. um, but it's so cool because like there's stray cats that like walk around, and you know it's so fun watching the sunsets with the, the water, and it's just magical. So I know what you mean. But hey, a high end ten million dollar property with an infinity pool, I guess that's not bad too. <laughs> no, can't complain but at all. <laughs> that's the life that you've created. You created this life by design, and that's what is so exciting. And so I just want to say thank you, Michael, for being on the show. Um, before we wrap up, tell people where can they find you if they want to, you know, follow you or learn more about you or real estate, whatever that might be. Yeah, for sure. I'm, ha I'm happy to, to chat or help anyone I can. Um, on Instagram, my, my handle is mbrockway120. So my first initial last name, 120. And then my email is mike at switchbackholdings.com. Also on Facebook and LinkedIn under Mike Brockway. Excellent. And we'll put that in the show notes for you guys. Uh, so if you want to get in touch with him, you can or follow him uh, and his awesome journey. Maybe see those pictures of that great infinity pool he'll be hitting later this year. But Michael, thank you for joining us today. There's so much more we could cover. Um, we'll have to have you back again, and especially after that adventure. But I just want to say thank you for sharing all your wisdom and how you've created this life by design for you. And we look forward to connecting with you more. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. My pleasure. Thanks. All right. See you guys.